Good evening, everyone. Uh, most of you don't know me. My name's Tom Smart. I'm part of the team here at Dornoch Christian Fellowship. And on behalf of the Fellowship and the Royal Dornoch Golf Club, who partnered with us to put on this event tonight, I'd just like to thank you all for coming along and supporting us here this evening. Now, as you know, uh, Bill Rogers is going to tell us a little bit about his life things that are important, what made him what he is today. And he's going to be, I'll do a question answer session and, and Neil Hampton from the Royal Dornick is going to be uh, asking the question. So I want to thank Neil for, for doing that this evening for us. Now, there's quite a few Americans. If you're, uh, are there a number of golfers here? Golfers? Easier to count, <laughs> easier to count people that weren't golfers. <laughs> And the uh, uh, three, <laughs> and the uh, people from America here. Wow, wow. Well, I'd like to congratulate you guys for actually braving air travel to come to Britain at the moment. When you see what's going on at Alexa Heathrow with cases, did you all get your cases? <laughs> yeah, well done. Okay, well, a very warm welcome to you guys as well. And the. Uh, also, I want to give thanks to uh, Tim Philpott. Tim has been a, a good friend of ours here at the Fellowship for a number of years, and he's a good friend of the World Door Golf Course, and he's the guy that brought this together. So I want to say a special thank you to him, and also a thank you to the, uh, the people who helped put this on, the food at the back and getting everything set up and that. So a special go. thank you to you as well. Uh, now, just before I uh, hand over to Neil and, and uh, Bill, I'll just uh, open with a short prayer and ask God to bless our time here this evening. Uh, so I'll just pray just now. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. We thank you for brought us here together this evening to spend the evening together. And we thank you for, for bringing Bill to us as well, Lord. And we thank you for the for the gifts you've given him in his life and lord we do pray lord that uh, as, as he speaks to us as uh, the, the interviews him lord that they you would help us to learn something relevant indeed to our own lives as well lord so i just ask heavenly father that you would bless our time here together this evening that it would be to your glory and we pray this in jesus name amen, amen. now just ask uh, neil and bill to come up thank you tommy Thank you very much. I think it's great in this week of the 150th playing of the Open Championship. We're delighted and honoured to have the 1981 Open Champion, Mr. Bill Rogers. <laughs> I, was, I was very fortunate today to spend four hours with Bill. I took him up from St Andrews uh, this morning to be here. And it was great to sit in the car and listen to the stories that he's going to tell you today. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to have that information from you, Bill, to have that feeling of your passion for the game and how, how you enjoy the golf and what it's given to you. And I think for us all here, I mean, and Tommy asked us, we all play golf. We all, most of us play golf here. But how did you manage to get into the game? What was the, the spark that got you playing golf and, and where did it take you? Well, I was brought up in a uh, Air Force. I was an Air Force brat. My uh, dad was an officer in the military, the Air Force. And... Kind of lived all over the world, but I would tell you, uh, my family was a golf family. Uh, heck, my dad, uh, he, was, he was great at playing with the generals. He was a good player himself, so he entertained the generals. And uh, my brothers and I naturally just picked up the game of golf. And, you know, we, uh, we were kind of good athletes, so we were able to pick up the game pretty quickly. And uh, for me, that was about age eight. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a game that just kind of fit right off the bat. It, uh, it was something my family loved. And is a, I don't know how, how early, uh, you know, God tells you that you're a competitor. But at nine years old, I was competing. Every, the first time I ever put a golf club in my hand, I was competing. So uh, it's been a, a beautiful ride, uh, you know, being involved in the golf world. And that, that was my start. And at, at what point did you realize that your talent was special and it was going to be slightly more than, than just a, what we are, club golfers? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, I was uh, uh, kind of strapped up with this competitive uh, uh, 
desire to play the game really even early on. I, I just, you know, I could do it pretty easily right from the very start, but uh, that didn't mean much unless I was competing against somebody. I, I like to play. I like to uh, see how I stacked up against everybody else. And at really a very early age, I, uh, I started competing. And I think it's just uh, maybe a, a, a natural thing for a competitor to want to compete. And uh, I started out much like the young guys even today in the junior ranks and kind of grew up through the game, had a lot of important people speak into my golf game. But uh, as, a, as a, really a high schooler uh, with, the, with the thought of going to university on the horizon, which I eventually ended up at the University of Houston, uh, which at the time was a golf powerhouse, lots of, lots of great uh, players went and came out of the University of Houston. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I was just focused on uh, improving my skills enough to where I could go to the university and then beyond that, play the PGA Tour. That was kind of a dream of a, uh, of a golfer, even at a, a very young age. So, uh, my dad used to take us to professional golf tournaments in, uh, in the Byron Nelson in Dallas, and I actually went to Augusta one time uh, early on as a junior. And so there were pl plenty of things that inspired me as a young man or a young boy to uh, be w wanting to be involved in the game of golf. And, it just, uh, from the very start, was a very good fit for me, and mm -hmm. uh, I kind of uh, started living the dream early on. Yeah, you, you mentioned the University of Houston there, and I think from, from what we read here that 1973 was a special year for you. Yeah, I uh, had the good fortune of uh, having re really good friends, good teammates, and the beautiful thing about the University of Houston was it, when I got to school, I walked in the door with 23 other freshmen, Bruce Litsky and Bobby Watkins, uh, which were, came to be my best friends. Uh, heck, we, we joined 17 others. There were 40 people on our golf team, which is kind of unheard of, but there were a lot of people to, uh, uh, to test you and to, you know, compete with. So that was the beginning part of really kind of uh, being, uh, developing into a, you know, a, a player that might even uh, have a chance to get on the tour. So that was the real proving ground for me. And it was a great experience. College, I'd, uh, some of these young kids bypass their college experience. I'd always be one to encourage them to experience the, uh, you know, great friends, lifelong friends in college. And then, you know, the tour is going to be there. Uh, you know, it'll, uh, it'll wait for you. But uh, it was only after I uh, got out of school, after four years, that uh, I, I went to the tour, uh, joined the tour. Yes, yeah, so, but b before that, All-American in 1973? Yeah, I, had, uh, I was fortunate to have a, a nice amateur career and had several wins as a, uh, as a University uh, of Houston team uh, member. But uh, the, I guess one of the nice things that happened as an amateur player was I got to play in the Walker Cup matches which uh, was really kind of the amateur version of the Ryder Cup. Uh, we played against Great Britain, and we actually uh, competed at the uh, Brookline, the country club, where they played the U.S. Open this year, and uh, we were fortunate enough to win. But that was kind of uh, the final stepping stone amateur-wise uh, before I began to uh, get, get ready for uh, tour qualification. Yeah. yeah, the Walker Cup's very, you know, prominent for us. I mean, we're, we're hosting, last week we hosted the Senior Amateur oh, Championships right, yeah. here, yeah? And, and we as a club have stated the claim that we would like to host the Walker Cup. Now, now you've played the course this afternoon. What do you feel as a, a match play, a Walker Cup venue Royal Dornick is? Well, they'd, they'd make a mistake if they didn't come to Royal Dornick. I, 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 I know that for a fact. Uh, uh, a little off track, I would tell you that uh, in the States, especially amongst golf, real golf people, uh, Royal Dornick is held in very high esteem and really known as, if not the best course in the world, you know, certainly in the top two, three, whatever, uh, however you want to evaluate that. But uh, the idea that you would have an opportunity to host the Walker Cup matches, I, I think it'd be a, a serious oversight if that didn't happen. But I, I like your chances. And uh, anyway, uh, my experience today uh, playing Royal Dornick, I'd, I'd, I'd come with a group of friends 20 years ago, and I was telling Neil that, uh, that there was so much on my plate and so many things to take care of that I really missed the true experience of playing 
uh, the golf course. I, and I really uh, remembered very little about, you know, the, the, the lay of the holes. And, uh, but today, I, I really soaked it all in and had a wonderful caddy, Neil, who uh, I think was your former, uh, or those of you that are members, your former caddy master. But it was a wonderful experience. And um, I'd, I'd have to say that I understand why my good friend Tim Philpott and others um, come in the summer and hang their hat and, and stay for a while and enjoy Dornick. Uh, Alistair, uh, your club champion there, it was uh, was in my group today, and it, that made it uh, quite comfortable to play the golf course. And you know, a fine player he is, but a better gentleman. And um, he was a, he was kind of the consummate host. But uh, we had a good day. I love uh, I love not only your golf course, but the you know the intimate feel of your little little town here. This is special. So uh, you know, we're in, my wife and I, Beth, who is here with me. Uh, you know, we big city San Antonio, Texas, and so it's nice to kind of escape the, the big city and, and get over here into some intimate territory in Scotland. No, it's, it's kind of you mentioned Alexander there, our current club champion. Well done again, Alexander, for fine performance in the wind this year. Yeah. <laughs> but, but coming off the 18th green today, I came and spoke to you both, and Alexander says, ask, ask Bill about Foxy. For those of you that play, you know Foxy is one of our best golf holes. No bunkers, 440 yards of Challenge. <laughs> so Alexander says, make sure you ask Bill about Foxy. So tell us how you played Foxy, well, Bill. Uh, I would tell I didn't know other than uh, Neil had mentioned that uh, you, you uh, might run into some uh, people at, at the club that uh, they're not concerned with what you shot or what you thought about the golf course, but they do know, want to know what happened on 14, Foxy. So anyway, uh, I guess that... Uh, you know, I followed the lead of Alexander. He'd hit a good shot in there, and I was blind to the flag, and so I finally hit one solid and kind of over the dune. I, I didn't even see the flag, and we walk up there, and Alistair's 12 feet, and I'm 8 feet, and uh, so somehow I shook that one in for birdie. I, I felt like, I, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I think we ought to start a plaque and put those that have, in the in the clubhouse and those that made birdie. But uh, we've been yeah. told that's not possible. Uh, <laughs> well, I, as I, I felt, it was like three net two. I mean, it was like a like a you know yeah. a real accomplishment. So tough hole, but it, it, it was that. I was glad I hit two good ones there. No, absolutely. But well done. As we know, form is temporary, but talent like this lasts forever. Well done, Bill. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> then we move on to your professional career. You turned pro in 1974. Yeah. And I think it'd be interesting to, to venture into that because, as we've said in the room, we, we know you for, for one tournament. But read, reading your resume, you've, you've had a, quite a storied career in the, in the professional ranks, a number of wins all around the world. How did it feel to get on tour? What was the anticipation like when you teed it up the first time? Yeah. Well, I would, uh, I would tell you, I, I knew really early on in college that I, I was destined to uh, play the tour. That's, that was, I was so singularly focused that uh, that's really all I had in, uh, in, my, in my sights. And so uh, I was in a position when I finished school that my skills were good enough to you know, it, it feel like that I had a good good shot at uh, getting through the qualifying school. I won't go into all the particulars there, but I was able to get through. And I uh, distinctly remember uh, after having getting my card and then Beth and I beginning the tour, I can remember showing up at the first tour stop, which was Tucson, Arizona. And I don't even know if it was at the beginning of uh, my uh, qualifying round or what it was, but I can remember the feeling coming over me this is exactly where you should be. This is exactly where you want to be. And of course, Beth and I at the time, I mean, we were 23 years old, no kids, but we're life, we're living the dream. I mean, you've heard that comment, we really are. We're foot loose, fancy free, and doing, uh, doing the tour. And uh, I'd had plenty of friends um, along the way that had played the tour, so I kind of knew the, uh, the setting, certainly, but. Uh, you know, we were we were all all in. Uh, you know, totally invested in this. And uh, when you're young, talented, uh, feel confident, and uh, you're hungry, you know, you 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 got a chance. So we were 
we were all, we were all about the tour. So we had a good start, felt comfortable, and felt like it's exactly where we needed to be. So 1975 was the start of the tour life for us. Mm -hmm. When you say comfortable, how, you, you, you fell into that quite easily. You got to know the guys on tour. Yeah. So how was it when you're approaching your first win? How, how nervous yeah. were you? How excited were you about actually getting across the line? Well, it was a, a process. I mean, it doesn't, uh, you know, when, when I, my era, uh, which I was, I, I feel like was the best era to play tour golf. I got to experience some of the, uh, the, the real greats, obviously Arnold Jack and uh, Gary Player, they were, they were still very much on the scene playing. Uh, obviously Tom Watson and Hale Irwin, uh, Johnny Miller, all, all of that group. But, you know, we got to uh, see from time to time, not necessarily playing, but the Hogan's, Nelson, they were still kind of prominent uh, in, in regards to tour life. And uh, obviously they're quite inspiring to, you know, know the history about uh, of the tour and how they influenced the tour. But uh, we got to uh, see them, uh, you know, from time to time and uh, to, to have that as a, you know, kind of a, a part of, of the tour was very meaningful to a young tour player. And then uh, the young guys today, I mean, you know, they, uh, they have a, 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 just one person as an era, and that's Tiger Woods, which is obviously who so many of them have patterned their, their, uh, their games after and, and, their, uh, and how they've lived uh, getting on the tour. But uh, I love the, the era that I played in and uh, felt like it was, uh, you know, just kind of the very best the tour ever got. And with the, with the tour, we, I know this is a little bit off base, with, but with the tour being challenged today in many ways, I don't have to probably tell most of you what's going on there. Uh, we need for uh, the very traditions of the game and everything that's good about uh, professional golf and really amateur golf to, uh, for, for people to hold the line and, and stand for the very integrity and honesty and, and the, the greatness of the game because it's at it, it risk now with uh, some of these other things that are going on. And uh, anyway, I think I know some of the, the people that developed up the tour, the, the Hogan's, Nelson, Sneeds, people like that would be absolutely, uh, you know, irate if they saw what was going on with modern day tour golf. But that's for another time. I didn't want to, I, I thought I'd touch on that. I think most of you know it. I could, I could, I could spend days talking about that, but, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, we, once again, to repeat myself, I, I'm very fortunate that I played in the, in the era that I did. Yeah, so, so what it, for, for the lesson no, no, what's it like to win? What does it feel like to, to yeah. hold the winning putt and go, wow, I'm the top of the heap? Well, I, I know where I was going with the start of my last uh, comment. You know, it, it's, a, it's a process <laughs> learning, uh, you know, how to develop into a player and, and one that even uh, has an opportunity to win. I know that when, when we came on tour, we felt like that there was a learning process needed before you could even think about winning. Uh, these kids today, they're, uh, I'm telling you what, I think even in high school, they're ready to come out and they're uh, so well developed up mentally and with their skills that uh, they're ready certainly when they come out of college. But we always felt like that we had to, you know, kind of uh, learn the different stages of the tour and kind of uh, ease into it. And it wasn't until my third year on tour, 1977, that uh, at the end of the year, we, uh, my wife and I traveled to the uh, Japan, the Teheo Masters, and that's where I won my first tournament. It was uh, kind of internationally a big tournament. And uh, kind of that was a, a game changer for me. I, I, I knew that I could win professionally and that was being at the end of the year uh, and then transitioning into January of 1978, I won my first tour tournament. And so it was kind of like off to the races, here we go. And uh, I've kind of validated that uh, once again, that it was, it's where I wanted to be and that I could be successful on the tour. Yeah, so the, the hardest one is the first one. We discussed today, Scotty Scheffler, several years on tour yeah. before he wins and he wins one and suddenly he's won four or five in a row. Yeah, so it's kind of catching light in a bottle. It's, uh, it's possible and that's where you just keep playing. You keep playing every week and uh, you just don't, don't know what might happen, but you put yourself in this position and uh, uh, you know, you, uh, you're prepared and you know, it'll, 
Uh, I had a, a learning process of having to control anger, temper, uh, those type things, and I could lose uh, my cool, you know, had to learn how to control my emotions, and that was all part, part of uh, kind of a learning process and actually moving on in, into winning golf tournaments. Fantastic. To hear you talk about, you know, how the confidence level changes once you've won one to go on to win more. Yeah. It takes us on to, to your, your banner year, really. 1981. Yeah. For those that don't know Bill's history, seven tournament wins in one year. Yeah, I still can't. I still can't believe it either. Huh? <laughs> so, what, what what did it feel like starting that season? Was there a different feeling about you? Were you striking the ball better? Was the practice better? Was it with the putts rolling? Did it feel different, or did it just happen? Not necessarily. We started the tour in January. I had two good. Uh, the first two tournaments had two good weeks, and then I missed five cuts in a row. <laughs> and uh, you know, right on the edge of panic, and uh, you know that it's a that's a bad place to be, no matter what you're doing. But I kind of, uh, you know, was was questioning, golly, what? How could how could this be? I, you know, I just uh, th this is kind of out of nowhere. And you know, I had a few little things uh, go on with my golf swing and my putting stroke and stuff, but. Anyway, somehow or another, I had a, a challenge match with a fellow named, a Japanese fellow, Aseo Aoki, many of you may remember that name, but uh, the, we were traveled to the Philippines and had a made-for-TV challenge match. And this was after the five cuts, and I, I, uh, I really had the thought of, I, I'm gonna withdraw, I don't even wanna go, go over there and do that. I've gotta, I've gotta somehow you know, panic this out at home and try to figure out something. But I ended up going, and interestingly enough, during the round of golf with uh, Aoki, I kind of found a little something that felt good. Like, you know, we're uh, got professional golfers are quirky, and I mean, we've got some strange things that go on, but we're, we're, we're always a little bit searching. But something happened, and I kind of felt all of a sudden like, well, that felt pretty good. And then it, uh, you know, I felt like I could gain a little confidence. Well, anyway, the long and short of it was I felt pretty good about how I played. I beat him and uh, came back to the States and the first tournament I played in was the TPC, the Tournament Players Championship in Jacksonville. Played pretty well and then the next week I won at uh, Harbortown at uh, Sea Pines Heritage Classic. And uh, you know, I just couldn't hardly believe it that um, post panic that all of a sudden I'm uh, back winning and you know, that kind of started a confidence level that uh, really kind of was almost catching light in, in the bottle, and I was, I was full on ready to go. And Before I, to I don't know if we want to get into all of it, but a month late after that, I finished second in the U.S. Open to David Graham at Marion. He, uh, if you, some of you would remember kind of, they call it the perfect round David, mm -hmm. David Graham played, but uh, he did, and I, I got close, but not close enough, but I was just brimming with confidence, and a month after that, I come to Royal St. George's in England, and uh, you know, give an athlete some confidence, a lot of confidence, and some, some f fun things can happen, and that's where I was, and um, I was able to uh, pull out a, an open championship victory at, at Royal St. George's, so it, uh, you know, I never dreamt at all of being a major championship winner. I was very, we were very happy just kind of cruising along, chiseling out a living, winning here and there, but it was, a, it, it was nice. And, you know, the better you play, you get a lot more friends and a lot of good things happen to <laughs> But uh, it, it really is, the tour, the tour it really is an unreal type world. The better you play, the less you have to think. If, if you just find the first tee every Thursday, you know, the whole world is pretty good. But, uh, you know, success breeds success. And I was kind of in that little bubble for a good, good while. And heck, you, it's something you never want to lose, never want to end. But uh, I kind of continued that streak through the year. And I think I won four more times after that. And oddly enough, I, I guess I found more of a comfort level internationally than I did at home because you know, that year I won f on four continents from Australia to uh, Japan to Europe and US. And, you know, I didn't see it coming, but I didn't, uh, I got out of my own way and let it happen. And it was a fun, uh, fun thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, interestingly, you said you won on four continents, but maybe the one that, that I was mo most intrigued by was the Texas Open, yeah. your home state. Had a lot of people that were involved in the Texas Open that considered 
that my second major. I won, I won that at, uh, we, we later moved to San Antonio uh, four years later, but uh, the Texas Open, winning in your state is important to every, uh, every tour player. Every tour player wants to win in their home state. And so I'd had two very close calls, finished second to Tom Watson at the Byron Nelson twice. He snuffed me out twice there. And, uh, but I got, did get him at the Open Championship in 81, about the only time. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, the Texas Open was special, and uh, my family was there, uh, you know, so anyway, that, that kind of mm -hmm. validated a, a, a real nice year. That was a special year. There was also one, one other thing that happened in 1981. Well, I think, I, uh, and Neil kind of, uh, kind of posed the question uh, and asked me, uh, you know, to kind of frame out and to uh, think about the, the Open Championship and... Uh, to some degree, kind of, uh, is that the most important uh, thing that's happened to you? And I would uh, put alongside that the 1981 Ryder Cup matches that we played at Walton Heath in England, uh, kind of for me anyway, rivaled that because uh, I was involved in arguably the greatest uh, American team ever put together. And, you know, as everybody uh, here has heard of every name I could mention on that team, uh, it was special. And we were captained by Dave Moore, Hugh. PGA champion, a, a, a Texan, and um, some of my best friends were on the uh, team, Jerry Payton, Bruce Litsky, Ben Crenshaw. But uh, we, were, we were strong on the, on the front end with Nicholas and Raymond Floyd, Tom Watson, Lee Trevino, Hale Irwin, Johnny Miller, Larry Nelson. Uh, I, I, I have that picture in my office. And I, and I go in there often and look at it. I said, what are, what are you doing in there? What are you doing in that picture? I honestly believe that because, uh, I mean, there were some, uh, some phenomenal uh, repre representatives of our American team that year. And uh, kind of we, 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 we had a good way with the uh, European squad that year. We beat them pretty good. But uh, that, was, that was a fond memory of mine and one that uh, would be right up there with the Open Championship. But I've been... Uh, truly blessed to have been able to represent my country twice, the Walker Cup matches and the Ryder Cup matches, uh, and with, with the teams that I was able to play on. Uh, professional golf kind of doesn't get any better than the Ryder Cup. You, the importance of the Ryder Cup has been elevated so much, and the fact of the matter is uh, you want on it so bad because it, it's such a different uh, – twist in your, your professional career. You're on a team rather than, you know, this individual hung out here playing, you know, 20, 30 weeks a year by himself. But now you got a team uh, focus and a team aspect and it's, it's just extra special. And, you know, players will uh, beg, bar and steal to get on it. Just, uh, you know, it's a, you, you, you'll do anything you can to play the Ryder Cup. <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the, the amazing stats, which I, I, I probably didn't realize about the, the American team when, of the 12 men on the team, 11 were major champions. Yeah, that's right. You yeah. know, yeah, was... and, and I asked you who, who was not the major champion. Yeah, my best friend, Bruce Litsky, who, uh, again, back to walking in the door with him, who, who is not with us, the, he, he, we passed away three years ago, which was way too early for my friend to go. But... Uh, he was he was very meaningful to that that team. I do remember that Bruce and I uh, not only walked in the door together at school, but we roomed together for four years. Best friends, our families, uh, best you know, close children, the whole works. But uh, uh, what was I what was I going with Bruce? Uh, Anyway, I know, uh, Dave Marr uh, is, is, is pairing up, you know, he's got plenty of input with, you know, uh, uh, Nicholas and Trevino Floyd. I mean, he's got plenty of people giving him advice and, and all of them uh, kind of agreed, well, golly, Rogers and, and Litsky, they're both playing great. They're, they're automatic to be teamed together. We'll, we'll send them out in the foursomes in the morning and they can play the four ball in the afternoon. Well, we got absolutely thumped on, in both, uh, both matches. <laughs> And we're both, you know, feeling a little bit low, a little depressed. And um, I remember, you know, kind of having, having my dauber down a little bit. And Raymond Floyd uh, and I and, and Dave Marr were, were close together. And, and Raymond said, give me Bill tomorrow. Give me Rogers. I'll, 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 we'll win a point for you. And we did. I mean, he, <laughs> took, uh, he took me and coached me, coached me through the, 
through the match, but that, that was a that was a good thing to happen. But yeah, we we had some special memories there. Yeah, and and Bruce, yeah, a fantastic golfer. But there's a, a story that does arounds about Bruce and his, his lack of practice and the fact he didn't play much off season. Yeah, Can he you was a, he was a tour player's envy. We all everybody envied Bruce because he, he he literally didn't work at it, but he was so strong minded and had. Uh, you know, a set way to play golf, which was a, a, a big left-right shot cut. I, I, th I claim it was closer to a slice than a cut. <laughs> but he was strong. He could hit a long way. But uh, he played one way, and, that, and he could not be convinced to, uh, to try or do anything else. He was, uh, he said, I'll go down with this. I'll go down with the, you know, and this is the way I'm going to play, and this is the way I'm going to do it. I'm not going to uh, practice. I like to play. I like to compete, but I'm not going to work at it. And he didn't. Uh, you know, he spent a lot of time with his family, and you know, didn't play a, a, as full a schedule as a lot of guys. But he he was very uh, very successful, tremendously ex successful. Not only as a regular tour player, but as a senior player as well. And uh, our, I, I'm, they they uh, polled a, a group of seniors at a senior event when Bruce was still playing the regular tour and somebody had asked the group, uh, who would you most like to pattern your uh, professional golf life after? And, and, and all of them agreed, Bruce Litsky, <laughs> not work at it, but play great. You know? <laughs> so he, he was a one-off though. That doesn't happen very often, I can promise. And, and again, to finish with Bruce, what's the story of the banana? Sorry? The banana. What's the story of Bruce oh, and the gosh, banana? Oh, yeah, gosh. Everybody's probably heard his banana story. When he was finished in the, with the tour in October, he would uh, pack up his golf bag, and Beth and I had been to their home. It, uh, it was, he lived on a big lake in Oklahoma, and he would take his golf clubs in the travel bag, and he'd put them in the laundry room, and he would not touch them till he came out to his first tournament in January. Well, his caddy decided at his last October event, to put a banana in his driver head cover just to see if, if it was true that he was not playing or practicing in the off season. <laughs> so anyway, we show up at, in January, first tournament I can't, and I, I'm, I'm sure I was there. But sure enough, we unzip his tra or he unzips his travel bag, and boy, this, 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 this <laughs> odor comes out and about knocks everybody down. But he, he says, what in the world is that? And he starts peeling off his head covers. And sure enough, under the driver head cover was this rotten banana. And his driver was ruined, had to get another driver, which his caddy, uh, you know, got rebuke for. But, uh, you know, he, he was true to himself. He'd put them in the, in the laundry room, wouldn't touch them. And mm -hmm. that, was, that was proof. <laughs> Fantastic. We, we couldn't finish on the Ryder Cup without talking of, of the great European Ryder Cup, Seve. What, yeah. what's, you, you've played with Seve, you've, you've been with Seve. What's, tell us your stories of Seve. Yeah. Well, that, um, back to my earlier comment about playing the best air, I played a lot with Seve, uh, you know, and, and Tom Watson, but Seve in particular, we were going good at the same time. He went good all the time, but I got to play a lot with him and uh, he was very distractive to play with because uh, he was so incredibly talented, particularly around uh, with his short game that, he, you know, I just felt like a spectator playing with him. And before you know it, he'd shot 68 and I'd shot 75 because I'd watched him all day. But uh, he, was a, he was a tremendous talent and uh, very controversial. He, he was a strong-minded guy. He had a lot of issues with a lot of uh, the American tour players for sure. He was a very controversial in Ryder Cup matches, but I loved him. He was very, always very kind to me and uh, respectful, and I was of him as well. But uh, there's, there's never been, I know Tiger Woods, Phil Mickelson are the top of the heap when you start thinking about great players with great short games. But um, arguably, Seve, Seve Ballesteros had the best short game and was just phenomenal to watch. At the Tournament Players Club, when the uh, Tournament Players Championship was at Sawgrass, Seve would get, there was a pot bunker that was a part of the practice area. And it, it, all of you are very familiar with pot bunkers. Well, Seve would get in there with a three iron and uh, we all carried three irons back then, by the way. But uh, he would get in the bunker with a three iron and he would hit sand shots with the three iron like they were 58 degrees uh, sand wedges. 
and every, uh, we'd just sit there and just marvel at, at how, he grew up on a beach in, in Spain, and uh, it was either a three or five iron, I, I'd kind of been probably a five iron, but what, whatever it was, he could, was it a three iron? Yeah, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, he could just, he could just do stuff that nobody else could do, but he, he, would, uh, he would get a crowd of professionals over there to watch him do this, and he could do anything with his hands. He had the greatest hands of any, any tour player, but he was a, he was a good gentleman and, and, um, and, and did it well, and he was, he was great for our game. No, it was indeed a, a sad loss to us like Bruce is. Um, thinking about the tour then, when, when, you, when you see a draw coming out for Thursday and you scan out who am I playing with, was there guys that you look forward to playing with think, I, I can really enjoy this? There's guys that you thought, well, I, I'm not looking forward to this. Yeah, not there's, the yeah, there were more, more that uh, you could identify that you didn't want to play with. But, <laughs> and I might have been one of those for somebody else. But, you know, everybody has, your, has their style, uh, you know, fast, slow, medium, whatever. But there were some guys that you could identify that you would rather not be paired with. And I won't... Uh, you know, list any names or tell you, but, but uh, there were some players that were very slow that, golly, I drew him again. I didn't, you know, kind of can't believe that. But, uh, uh, and then there were some, I love to play with Tom Watson. He had a, he had a, a wonderful demeanor and, and it was easy to play with, highly competitive, but he was easy to play with. And most, uh, I wouldn't want to mislead you, most everybody was fine, but there were, there were a, a handful of, players that were pretty difficult to play with and for a lot of different reasons. I, I won't go into that, but <laughs> it usually had something to do with pace. Uh, fast players didn't like to play with slow players and by, you know, vice versa. So it could get a little squirrely out there at times. Just, just before we move on from, from 81 and, and those seven wins in the Open Championship, I've, I've got a note here and, and thanks to Mike, I've, I've borrowed your notes, Mike. Very good of you. It says that you almost missed your first round tea time in the 91 Open. I did, yeah. Uh, my caddy and I had finished our practice session hitting uh, warm-up golf balls uh, on the practice tee and we're on the putting green and had completely lost track of time. And my caddy was a, not asleep, but he was unaware of what time it was. I'd kind of kind of lost the you know, thought of my tee time and I was just putting around. And um, all of a sudden this uh, sports writer for the uh, Daily Mail walks out on the putting green says, uh, Bill, I, th I think you, you, your game might be on the first tee. And I looked over there and I was playing with uh, Maurice Brimbridge and I uh, think, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember who. And sure enough, they're on the tee box and I've got about less than a minute to get there. It's about a 30 or 40 yard walk over there. So we sprint over there and, you know, literally just uh, have to tee off when I, when I get there. But it, had he not walked out of there, you know, say la vie, I'm, I'm, I'd have never made my tea time. So that was a, uh, you know, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, I certainly, uh, you know, an interesting, uh, every year I would play in the Open Championship, I'd always see that sports writer and give him a big hug and thank him. And we had a good, good relationship, for sure. <laughs> your, your last win, uh, 1983, yeah? When you look back, did you realize that was your last win? Did you think there's more to come? Uh, no, that. Um, however, I, it was a, it was in New Orleans, and I, heck, I, I played a, a, a nice tournament, and it felt good to win again. And heck, I kind of uh, felt like you know things were right in order. And uh, one thing interesting about that, we just had our first child, our, our daughter, and. You know that that's a game changer. Is uh, but you know as it relates to traveling the tour, that that, that changes the landscape. And so, um, not that's exactly uh, related to winning again. But you know the life is good, and you know it feels like that everything's right on track. And I don't know. Um, not long after that, I I'd played so much golf in 1981, 82, 83, well early 83, and. Uh, as I mentioned, it had some success a lot of different places around the world that um, as, as a result of that, I had long-term commitments to uh, not only play our tour, but you know, go back to Australia, Japan, Europe. And 
So, I mean, I was just gone. But I loved it to a certain degree because I loved the almighty dollar. I love that, I love that money. <laughs> I don't like, you know, a lot of things have changed, but, but that, uh, that idol of that money really got my attention and I liked it. And as an open champion in 81, uh, you get a lot of opportunities to go chase the dollar and I didn't disappoint. I went every corner of the globe, uh, uh, you know, going for it. And so anyway, that's not where you went with the 83 question, but you know, without even knowing it, I had uh, I'd begun to feel the feel the effects of uh, you know kind of normal tour golf because I had so much obligation everywhere else uh, that it, probably not consciously thinking about it, but I, I had a lot going on that I wasn't aware of, but still you know young and and still going for it, but it took its toll, and I think we might, might get there. It took its toll eventually, and, uh, but as, as, as early as 80, 1983, I was, uh, I was still all in and ready to go. In 82, to backtrack a little bit, um, I'd, I'd finished my 19, uh, 1981 was a magical year. I'll never forget teeing it up in uh, early January, the, uh, I think I missed the first tournament. The second tournament was in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'll never forget uh, walking onto property. It was either Monday or Tuesday, and all of a sudden the press, uh, the, the uh, media uh, guy that led the, uh, all the press comes up and he says, you've got a media obligation at 1.30 or something like that. Well, anyway, the world as I knew it had completely changed in that regard. I, now I had media obligations to go and give a press conference and this and that and things were things were completely different and I recognized them not that I didn't like it I like the adulation the attention and all that but uh, my world as I knew it is it related to playing you know it changed I had to do other things uh, just to finally get to a, a, a playing situation be that as it may Thursday morning rolls around like I said my first tournament of the year I tee my ball up and the guy that announces the players, Bill Rogers, 1981 Open champion. And gosh, I hadn't heard that, you know, since uh, certainly from anybody uh, announcing me on the first tee. And I can remember that kind of got my attention and I tee my ball, step behind my shot, visualizing my shot. And all of a sudden the thought came over me, you've got to do it again. You've got to validate what you did last year. And it was like I, put the Empire State Building on my shoulders and you know the self-inflicted pressure that we'll do no matter what you do uh, or at any level. But uh, yeah, I, I, I decided that I was just, you know, I had to repeat what I did, like what well, was not repeatable, uh, obviously, but I didn't think so. So I put, you know, and all of a sudden I was real awkward probably for about three months, I played, played uh, mediocre to ordinary to bad my first three months and June rolls around the US Open is at Pebble Beach and uh, I won't go through the whole detail but uh, I, Tom Watson and I are leading uh, after three rounds tied paired together the last day and anyway the long and short of that is that uh, you know, it was his time to win I led the, the Open through 54 holes nine holes that day but then you know, Watson heroics, he ended up winning. Uh, he did some just ridiculous things. Uh, if, has anybody seen the chip in that he had on <laughs> 17? S still sad they don't pay a royalty for that because I've got a, a, a prominent spot in that. But uh, it was his day to win. And he, ultimately, you know, he, Nicholas was right there and made a great charge and everything. But uh, I kind of had a moment there, but, um, uh, you know, that was really, uh, really a blow because. Uh, I'll never forget my father had driven cross country to uh, watch me play the last round with Watson. And Beth and I are at breakfast, uh, I'll never forget it, a place in Carmel called uh, Friar Tucks, having breakfast. And my dad walks in, and I knew he was coming, but I didn't. So he walks in, he sits down at the table. The first thing that rolls out of his mouth is he said, do you realize if you win today, you'll be the national champion of three countries? I said, oh my gosh, <laughs> Threw, about th heaved up all that I, my breakfast there, but uh, could have said anything but that, and you know, I often say that a, a, an athlete is very fragile, and you know, you've got this mentality going, and that's, 
but uh, the long and short of it, that didn't didn't affect me that day. But that was a heck of a thing to to hear before <laughs> before the opening round. And he w he was right. That would have it would have been a heady spot to have been. But uh, anyway, the rest is history. Yeah. yeah. When we look at a lot of players that tour now, they all play for a long time. They're all you know your physical fit, their physical fit. But you only did 14 years on tour, yeah. which in, in today's parlance is quite a short career on tour. What? How did the end come about? What, what were your feelings? You talked about that moment with Tom Watson there. It, yeah. it, was that the beginning of the end, or was that, was that a catalyst for you thinking, why am I here? Yeah, not not really. It was it was uh, it was a few a few years later, but um, you know the all the all that I'd mentioned before uh, and the things beginning to take a toll. I could I could kind of sense uh, maybe as early as 1985 uh, that. Things just didn't feel quite like that. I'd actually gotten a little complacent with uh, working at it. Um, like I said, I'd, uh, I'd gone hard. I, you know, frankly, uh, was fat and happy. You know, you've heard that expression. You know, I'd made a bunch of money. You know, and I, I'm uh, going. I'm in the world, man. I'm getting all I'm cars and houses and boats, and I'm trading cars about every three months. It, it seemed like you know, and just absolutely crazy, crazy type stuff. Had no no real basis or foundation with which to, you know, kind of uh, manage all that had come our way. But I could sense, um, because of all that had, had transpired in that amount of time, that, you know, things just didn't feel quite like they had. And uh, the great players that continue to play well and great, they, they learn to manage themselves and recreate uh, new, new motivations to play the game. Uh, because it, it can become uh, a, a quite a monotonous thing. You do the same thing year after year after year, and kind of finding new ways to uh, uh, be motivated uh, is a is a real important aspect of playing the tour. But uh, about 1986, uh, I think, uh, and that was my last exemption year to play in the uh, Open Championship, the Masters, and the U.S. Open. Uh, I began to question whether is this something I'm going to. Mm -hmm. uh, continue to do. 1987, I kind of really fell off in terms of, you know, just didn't hardly want to play much. In 1988, I just went through the, the motions. It was my last official year to play the, the tour. And I had a, a, a three-year uh, exemption beyond that. I could have continued to play. But um, I felt like the, 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 the time was right to, to leave, leave the tour. Beth didn't. She loved the tour life. She was good at it. And it's very important to have a supportive spouse that can uh, can support you and, and take care of all the details to where all you have to do is play. But uh, she loved it, and she uh, she was kind of sad, I think, uh, to to for the reality that we might not be doing this much longer. So anyway, I, I left the scene after the 1988 season, and uh, you know, uh, ready to try on uh, something different. Yeah, and and. It's intriguing as to what you did next actually and you know you didn't give up the golf game altogether you got into a different form of, of working in golf yeah yeah probably the uh any tour player would probably tell you the uh certainly in my era that the last thing that they would and this is all due respect to this profession because it is truly a high calling profession that being a golf professional at a country club or a golf club and what they do but the last thing a, a touring professional, a professional golfer would tell you that they would want to do or have to do, uh, especially a successful tour player is that you are going to be a club professional at a country club. And God saw it fit to where that was where I was going to start my humbling uh, process <laughs> at a country club. And, um, you know, I got my feet under me. It took six, eight months of sorting things out. And the opportunity uh, came forward that uh, the San Antonio Country Club is looking for a golf professional. And initially, I said, well, you know, I'm never going to do that. I can guarantee you. But it, from the encouragement of many and kind of some uh, prayer and thought, thought about, you know, this next chapter in my life, uh, it, it came pretty clear that that's what I was going to do. And, in, you know, where I'd been in a, in a world, in a profession where... You know, it was very much self-serving. It was all about me, all about self. I tra I'm get, getting ready to transition into a, a, a profession where now I'm serving 1,500 members in a, in a, in a golf country club setting, which uh, 
you know, I found out was, uh, was a sweet spot for me. I, I, I love people, I love to serve, and it was the perfect place for me. And uh, as I'm given the great opportunity of this, uh, able to reflect back, you know, I know God's hand was firmly on my life, and we're gonna, uh, we're gonna see what happens in this little, uh, this little transition period and, and see how you're gonna evolve and be in a club professional. But uh, I learned so much, many wonderful people, and a lot, interestingly enough, at this point in my life, leaving tour life, uh, the most important people in my life began to come right in, uh, in my path. And people that were mentored me, spiritually mentored me, and coached me, and loved on me, frankly, and fellowshiped with me, all the things that a good friend needs, uh, leaving where I was and where I uh, am now, so, uh, heck, I found it to be, uh, you know, a, a, a tremendous uh, point in my life. And the, I, I was telling Neil earlier, when I left the tour, one of the great affirmations of, uh, of knowing that I had chosen right to go home and begin a new beginning was I never missed the tour one second, never missed uh, competing one second, never missed any of the... Uh, uh, the lifestyle or, or what the tour, uh, you know, had offered up for me. Forever grateful for that beautiful 14 years, for the most part of which were, there were a lot of ups and downs and in-betweens, but uh, the fact that I never had a regret about it uh, pretty much affirmed that uh, we're, we're, we're going uh, to be in a good spot from here on in. You know, my most important person was Beth, and she, she knew that it was very important. We have two, two kids at this time. Uh, a son that was born in 1986 and my daughter in 83, but she said, we're, we're gonna get our kids in church. We're gonna begin to go to church. We're gonna be in a Sunday school. We're gonna grow uh, you know, in our faith. And you know, that was just an important aspect of our new journey. And so uh, I felt like um, you know, this, 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 is a, this is a good spot for us to be. You just mentioned your kids. I mean, do they play golf? Do you do you coach them? Do you do you help them? Yeah, my, my son. Uh, in fact, he he turned into a pretty good little player. I mean, you know, something about whether it's genes, whatever. But I mean, he could. Uh, he was an athlete, and he could play. And he actually went to school, Texas A and M, uh, in College Station, Texas. He played for a year and a half, and. He, uh, I'll never forget a Christmas break. He comes in the kitchen. I'm in the kitchen. He says, Dad. He says, you know, I just don't think this is going to work. I wake up every morning and there's 11 of my teammates that they can't wait to get out there and play golf and compete and, and, and just go hard. He says, I, I, just, I just don't have it in me. And I, I, I just wanted to sing hallelujah right there. I said, oh, gosh, I love that. I'm not going to have to. I'm not going to have to live and die with every golf shot he hits for the rest of his life, you know. And uh, frankly, that, that, that's absolutely the truth. But he made a good decision. He, he could see that if he was going to graduate from college, he needed to spend time in the book. So that was a real blessing that he kind of uh, put that aside. And, but to, even to today, he's quite a good player. So mm -hmm. it's, the game has served him well, yeah. Yeah, but you've, you've done a bit of coaching in your life. Did you? Yeah? Yeah. After. Uh, gosh, I've done so many things. I don't think there's anything in the golf world uh, that I haven't touched. I, um, one of the, it wasn't long after I left being a club professional or a golf professional at, at San Antonio Country Club, I was invited into a partnership that we developed a, a, a club, which was all about uh, the very building of the club. We uh, hired Tom Pazio to build our golf course. He built us a beautiful golf course. We built the business of uh, you know, membership, uh, trying to uh, solicit membership. And we built a very nice, uh, uh, successful club, but the partnership fell away in 2007. I stayed on for a couple, two or three more years and then was approached by the university in San Antonio and uh, the athletic department and asked if I'd like to uh, coach the, uh, the golf teams. And I said, you know, I... I don't think I want to be a head coach, but I will uh, be a director of golf, so to speak, for the two teams. I'd love to be involved. So they hired two coaches. I was involved with the young men and women uh, on the golf teams, and that was a that was a beautiful place to be, being able to speak into uh, these young people's uh, lives. I, I thought it was a high calling. Uh, 
type yeah. opportunity for me. So it was, uh, I, I, I cherish that time. Wonderful. Sure. No, great. Thanks for helping out the young kids and getting them on the, on the way in and the stories you've told them, I'm sure, about your career and how it's going to help them. That kind of winds us back to where we are today. Yeah. And we had a very nice discussion today about what St Andrews and what the RNA have put on this week for the past champions. Yeah. We had a, a beautiful uh, two days. Every year, the two, uh, Open returns to St Andrews. They invite all the past champions back. And uh, it's, uh, it's just a special, uh, they, they, they wine and dine us, take good care of us. Uh, Monday this year, they had what uh, a four hole challenge where all the past champions, well, this year it was different in that we were paired with uh, some different uh, players. There were some handicapped uh, uh, people involved in the day. There were uh, women that were involved in the uh, four hole challenge. I know Laura Davies was there. Uh, she was one of the, uh, uh, highlight highlighters of the four of the four holes, but I played with two uh, amateur champions, a British amateur champion and a European amateur champion. Uh, I was originally paired with David Duvall and Ernie Els, and neither one of them showed. So uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know exactly what happened, but I played with the two amateurs, had a wonderful time, and uh, one of the one of the uh, teams had a, a fellow that played with one leg, and you know a lot of the <clears throat> uh, Amputeed golfers these days have prosthesis that they're, you know, fitted with and able to do quite well. Well, this uh, this individual he's from Spain. Um, this this guy was something else. He uh, he doesn't have a prosthesis. He was born with, uh, you know, a, a, a leg with uh, the, he had no leg below his knee. But he uh, he he walked around with his crutches. But to hit a shot, he'd drop his crutches, and he'd, uh, well, he, it was his left leg, and he just hit the, uh, his shot with, it was unbelievable how good he was. He, you know, he, he drove it just like, uh, you know, just like if he had, had two legs, but, and kept his balance, you know, through all of a full swing, everything it was remarkable stuff. But they had uh, a little uh, small woman that played that, uh, you know, I, I don't even, she was, uh, she, had some kind of intro into the game uh, that was, you know, and she was a highlighted player in in whatever league that uh, that she played in, and gosh, all kinds of different different people that made the day special. But the highlight was the champions dinner on uh, Tuesday night, and I had the great privilege of sitting next to Ernie. He didn't show for the golf, but he showed for the dinner. So I was sitting next to him, and we had a, a, a wonderful conversation and. You know, um, particularly about how all the South Africans seem to be such good good swingers of the golf club, and you know he's just a fine gentleman. If you need somebody to pull for on the on the tour, put, pull for Ernie Els. He's a he's a wonderful man, and um, I, I I was able to uh, visit with him in between. Trevino sat right across from me, and 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 you know there's just some, <laughs> he was he was nonstop chatter from the time we sat down and. You know, if I if I even looked away from Ernie and looked at him, boy, he was he was right on me, you know. But and he's telling some of his old stories. But it was it was tremendous. I uh, I got to meet some of the uh, players that I'd never uh, not met before, and they were new champions. Actually, Jordan Spieth and Shane Lowry, Colin Mor uh, Morikawa. They were they were all there. It was a neat neat collection of uh, of people. And Jack Nicklaus, who had been honored that day earlier in the day. As a citizen of uh, St. Andrews, whatever that was, he was he was there present at the dinner and uh, asked to speak. And you know he was uh, he was really quite emotional because he he had mentioned you know 2005 was supposed to be my last year, and I made the uh, comment that this is my last uh, Open Championship. And you know he stood on the Swilkin Bridge and waved goodbye, and that was. And he said, but when uh, they asked me to come back to accept the citizen of St. Andrews, I, or Michael, is that what it's called, or the? Yeah, the, I think the Freedom, maybe the Freedom of St. Mm -hmm. Andrews. Freedom, whatever that was, you know, there's only two before him that had received this, Benjamin Franklin and Bobby Jones. So he said, how am I gonna turn, turn that down? But he has a love affair with St. Andrews, frankly. He brought all his kids, his wife, and it was, it was wonderful. But, you know, he, he, he talked about that a little bit and, uh, and, and recognized, you know, the RNA and a lot of a lot of the players there, and for different reasons. But it was quite quite interesting to listen to. He sat down, and it was a uh, 
an immediate standing ovation. And I'll never forget this. And if asked about a, did I have a highlight at this year's Open Championship? But you know, I'm uh, I'm at a long table here, and, and Nicholas is over here, and everybody's standing up, and it's a it's an, uh, a long ovation. And I, I I peeked over there at him, he's just bawling. I mean, just absolutely crying. You know, and, and uh, that was a great tribute. I bet you he probably uh, you know was impressed as much with that as he was the award he had got earlier in the uh, earlier in the day, but. You know, that was a highlight. And then Gary Player gets up and, uh, and speaks. And he's a live wire. He, he's something else. I think, you know, I think he would really, uh, he, I think he's going harder now than he ever has. He's, he's 86. The only guy in the room older was Bob Charles, is five months older than him. He's 86. But uh, player thinks he's a comedian I'm telling you he's, he, it's unbelievable I mean everything out of his mouth are these one-liners and uh, he's just full of life and fun and he is funny but he gets up and uh, he gives this uh, remarkable eloquent speech he was prepared and not that it was uh, read off the sheet prepared he, he he just knew it from the heart and and Jack Nicholas and him are best of friends and he just gave such incredible about all of us were crying when uh, Gary Player got through, but you know he gave uh, the RNA, who is, you know, arguably so nicely standing in the gap right now for everything that's right about golf. He gave them massive tribute uh, about about doing, you know, so much for the game and everything that was right about the game, and then. Uh, just wonderful. It's, I just felt like a, a, a privileged character in the in in the group of champions there. But it was it was it was uh, worth the trip over for us for, to experience that, and you know, developed uh, a lot of wonderful relationships. I uh, I would like to tell one story. If, it, if mm. are we going too long? No, no, you can. Well, in two thousand was my first trip over to the Open Championship as an invited guest for the for those two events, the champion. Uh, the Champions Challenge, which actually was on Wednesday in 2000. My son went with me and caddied for me. But Tuesday night was the dinner. And uh, oddly enough, I, I would tell you that uh, Monday night over dinner, uh, I don't know if anybody, any of you would know this, but Tom Weiskopf has pancreatic cancer. And uh, he's, he's in a battle, a, a real battle. And from time to time, I've left him messages, texted him, what have you. Well, Beth and I are having dinner Monday night, and Tom Weiskopf calls. So I've got to take the call. And uh, he sounded quite fragile on the, uh, on the phone. Mm -hmm. And I uh, mentioned, well, you, you called it a good time. I'll, uh, we're, we're, you know, everybody here misses you and so on and so forth. But, you know, you, you've got a, an open champion calling you in, in, a, in, in, a, in a tough way right now. But... You know, it's kind of seemed ironic to some degree because in 2000, I sat next to him at the champion's dinner. And uh, it was a different feeling altogether uh, this year versus that year because there was a, a real light mood uh, in 2000. In fact, uh, quite a few had 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 a lot to drink. <laughs> and Tom, Tom was one of them. And uh, anyway, the secretary at this particular dinner starts going around. So would anybody like to, you know, anybody, it's an open forum, anybody can share a story. And, and uh, he said, well, Jack, why don't you start? So he kind of pointed Nicholas out to start, and Jack says, but there were a couple, two or three others that, and I, I knew Tom was gonna get up and say something, because he, he was kind of feeling his oats. And he said, I got a story. He said, okay, Tom. Well, anyway, he was talking about, and, and forgive me for not remembering the venue where the Open Championship was, this year that he was telling the story about. But he said, Jack and I were playing a, a practice round on Wednesday, the day before the tournament at, let's, just, let's call it Muirfield. I know it wasn't Muirfield, but he said, and we go out and we decided we were gonna play nine holes. You know, it's raining, wind blowing, like a typical Scotland day, but it was miserable. But we still decided we we're gonna go out and play nine holes. So we get around to the eighth hole, it's a par three, a lot of people following him around, obviously. And I know many of you would remember, you know, Weiskopf was, uh, he and Nicholas were foes, but they were very good friends. They went to school together, but, and both of them playing fabulous at, uh, 
you know, at the time of this story. But anyway, they step up on this par three, and uh, you know, like I said, the conditions couldn't be worse. Got a, the eighth and ninth to go, and uh, you know, ready to get to the clubhouse. But lots of people around. Box. Can we go? Are we still there? Okay. Well, uh, around the tee box and all down the side of the ropes, and um, they're kind of looking at their shot. But directly behind the pin was this one Scots, Scots, uh, Scotsman gentleman sitting on his shooting stick, had his all tweeds on, had his tweed tam on, or I think that's what you might call it. And he's sitting there, but he's got his pipe directly behind the pin. No big deal, but wind left to right couldn't be a, a, a more difficult win, especially with the, the rain and everything else. 195 yard shot, and uh, Jack gets up and uh, decides to hit a three iron, and uh, he, he hits one to the left of the green, hits it real high to kind of the left side of the green. Get, the wind gets it and blows it on the front half of the green. This green was kind of a two tier green like so top tier bottom tier and the pin was over the on the second tier on the bottom so anyway uh he, he, even jack nicholas hardly got a ripple it was a terrible it wasn't much of a shot but he did get it on the front part of the green well tom was telling the story he says i stepped up there and i decided i was going to hit a four iron so uh he pulls out the four iron and he said he just hit he, he, he said i hit the best four iron of my life it started right at the pin hooked to the left side of the green, the wind got it, ball comes down, lands on the top tier, pretty much in line with the pin, disappears over the, the, the hump there to the bottom tier. And as a tour player would always do, you look for reaction from anywhere around the green and this guy is sitting there right at the pin, doesn't budge. So Tom says, well, it probably curled off in the bunker. There was a bunker just to the left of the green. Probably caught the slope, went in the bunker. Doesn't make any difference. But uh, they walk up there, walk on the green. Jack walks over to his ball. Tom gets to the, to the top plateau right there and kind of looks down around the hole, no ball. Kind of walks over to the left bunker, no ball in the bunker. Walks through the green and he, and he sees, his, uh, uh, sees this guy sitting there and kind of walks back there looking for his ball and all of a sudden Jack says, Tom, your ball's in the hole, you made a one. <laughs> so Tom's right here next to the guy, and he says, sir, he said, uh, surely, surely you saw that ball go in the hole. He said, surely you thought that was a good shot, you didn't budge. The guy's sitting there, hadn't moved, so he takes the pipe out of his mouth, looks up at Tom and says, Laddie, it was a good shot, but it's only Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know how you are. That, that, those, that, that, they knew their goth over here, so he didn't get any love from the guys. <laughs> Excellent, Bill. Just, just I, want, I want to round off the, the questions I'm going to ask you anyway. Just the human element of golf and how, how you still feel about it. You, you told me a wee story about the Champions Challenge and standing on the first tee, and I think this is something we can all relate to what you told me. I knew you were going to bring, bring that up. <laughs> Frankly, I, I've had many a sleepless night uh, <laughs> leading up to the, the Monday tee shot at, at St. Andrews, although, although the, uh, the, the first fairway is as wide as Dornick, I mean, the town. I mean, it's, you, you, you can do anything and get it down there, but nevertheless, it's a, it, it's a nervous shot, especially if you hadn't been pulling any, any golf shots off for real, which I haven't. But it's uh, no matter who you are, you you feel a little little something going on down here, and uh, you know it's 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 cause for a little bit of concern. But fortunately, somehow I, I got my tee in the ground, ball on the tee, and and I was able to make a swipe at it and actually hit a pretty good pretty good shot down there. But uh, it's it's interesting. You kind of surprise yourself, even though you you know you play the game enough to where you feel like you can pull one off and, and get it down there but it's still it's still a little nervous a little little tense and and i know just about everybody that's not playing the tour regularly right now i know they had plenty going on here and that 
would include Trevino and, mm -hmm. and, and a bunch of the older guys. And, but I was very satisfied that I, I, got, I got it down range and it looked like at least a golf shot. You know, there, there have been some, uh, in back to Tom Weisskopf, uh in 2000, my son and I are sitting there and Tom hits in front of us and he, he hooks it out of bounds. So uh, I know there's been some squirrely shots hit off the piece of, anyway, yeah. yeah no, the first tee jitters gets us all, yeah, for yeah, sure. That's, it's, it's great to hear that even somebody long in your career still still has that desire, that, that knot in your stomach before you tee off. So sure. I know a few of the guys coming up, the Carnegie Shield standing on that first tee at Dorno, does the same to us all, the same thing. So yeah, it's great. Thank no, you for no, that, no, Bill. No. That's great, great listening to you, Bill. Thanks, thanks for doing that. And I know there's many people in the room here, and I'm sure there's some questions they want to ask you. So. Yeah. Does anybody have a question for Bill? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Bill, it was either 1979 or 1980, and you were in a playoff at Preston Trail with Tom Watson and Larry Nelson. Correct? Yeah, with, with Tom. Uh, Larry. Larry wasn't. Larry was in. Because I was there with you. <laughs> Larry was in the playoff? Yes. Uh, that's years. what I thought. I thought he, he started, was. On, <laughs> he started on the far five. Of yeah, Ronald right. God, and I didn't remember that. But I know you were there. I was there. <laughs> you were there. <laughs> you were there. Anyway, uh, nowadays everybody hits it from here to Kingdom Come, and, and the whole world knows that. But there were players back when Wood was hitting Balada that had a reserve. I'm wondering if you remember an aspect of the playoff that I remembered, and that was that you were not especially long, Larry was not especially long, but Watson had the extra 20. Yeah, he did. And yeah, he, he did. used it on that playoff hole to reach the green in two. Was that your recollection in that playoff as well? Yeah, somewhat. I remember he did have a, a, an extra gear uh, for sure. I can remember the, the one thing I do remember is that I hit a pitch shot that hit the flag and – uh, I, I think it was bounced four feet, you know, to the to the side, and I uh, I can't honestly remember what Larry did, but I remember I think Tom two putted for birdie, and I miss miss my putt, not and, and Larry obviously made five, I guess. Larry was no factor. No, no factor. Okay. <laughs> I just didn't yeah. know if you remember that, that. I remember going to the tee saying, "Son of a gun, he can reach the green." Bill and Larry can't yeah. think about it. Yeah, that was a. One of the Nice, nice advantage he had for sure. He was aggressive. Tom Watson was a very aggressive player. No wonder he played so well over here. But he, uh, he, he could, he could turn it up a notch for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. Yeah, for someone that left college in 1973, you look like you're in great shape. What do you do to stay in such good shape? Well, I, I can worry them off quicker than they can stay on. I, I, <laughs> not really. I don't really do too much. I, uh, I had my parents were kind of, my dad tall and thin, and kind of thin was in our, our family genes, but uh, I stay active. I, I, I do that. I don't, you know, I'm not a gym rat or anything, but I do, do stay, stay uh, busy or, you know, kind of active is the way I like to say it, but we're chasing grandchildren now, and that'll, that'll keep you busy. I know that feeling. Yeah, yeah, but uh, nothing special. Uh, uh, I'm not a great big diet watcher or anything. I've just uh, we just just kind of kept marching, stayed stayed after it. Cool. Yes, sir. Um, I'm a fan of the. Uh, uh, th thank you very much for your insight and and this evening. Uh, I'm sure all of us really appreciate everything you said. Uh, uh, I'm a fan of uh, the Bob Rotella books. Uh, have you had a chance to, to speak to that gentleman? I have, yeah. Um, and the reason I'm a fan is, is, is really the, the, the mental side of the game and, and, the, and the players that he references to. Um, now, uh, these days, it's, it's my impression that some of these guys, you know, they have their shrink, they have their, their caddies, they have, you know, no matter what, what, you know, you mentioned a lot about, yeah, I, I was, I, I felt competitive, I knew I had the skills. Um, how did you, uh, and you had your bride, uh, how did you uh, improve your mental game? Well, you, uh, I think even though you're 
in the beginnings of your tour life, you, you evolve as a player. And I was <clears throat> none to uh, put together as a, as a complete player by lots of experiences, lots of failures. I mean, you know, business, whatever we do, we're gonna learn more from mistakes. And I, uh, I think I was a good learner in that respect. I kind of played a way uh, of, of what I call almost mistake-free golf. I, I, I wouldn't, you know, didn't play out here too much. I played in front of me. I was just able to uh, keep the ball in front of me. I could, I could manage the, the golf ball. And that, that was a, a, a quite a good asset. But let me tell you, I had plenty of meltdowns, plenty of failures. I had plenty of uh, times to learn how to control uh, my emotions. Um, uh, lots, of, lots of opportunities like that. And a lot, of, a lot of people never get through that threshold. They, they give in to the, uh, you know, whether it's panic or the uh, getting too fast and, and not being able to uh, calm yourself, however you might do that. But it, it's necessary because things, uh, as my, our good friend Gary Player says, you have to lo love adversity. You have to embrace it because it's, it's a game riddled with adversity. You, you know, everybody can do it when it's easy and when things are going well. But... Uh, I don't care what you've done, you're gonna run into some kind of challenge in a round of golf, whether it's your first round, last round, you know, it doesn't make, and you have to, uh, you, you have to have things that you can uh, uh, rely on to uh, get, you, get you through. And, you know, we hear about breathing, you know, taking deep breaths and calming yourself, but, um, you know, you, you have to, you, you have to learn how to control your emotions because the kid, your body chemistry changes, man. Everything wants to move 100 miles an hour. My, the last round uh, um, at, at uh, Royal St. George's, I had a five-shot lead starting uh, the last round. And uh, uh, that so quickly evaporated. I made double on the seventh hole, and now probably six to eight people had a, a, were within one shot all of a sudden, just like that. Five shots to one shot in seven holes the last day. But I'll never forget walking to the eighth tee. I, did, uh, I was able to calm myself and understood, uh, you know, got my feet under me. I was able to calm my mind. You know, things want to race, you want to. But uh, experience had taught me my, my tendencies were to completely get out of control and, frankly, you, you know, so much so that you remember as a kid just, you know, throwing in the towel, oh gosh, you know, here we, here we go, you've thrown it away. You, but, but clear thinking and understanding that, you know, I played very well up until that point and uh, was, you know, uh, quick to get my emotions under control to repeat myself. But there was a, a experience, uh, experiential learning is so valuable. You know, you can go through all the books, all the, you know, little nuggets in there, and you can underline them, you can write them down, you can, but uh, you have to experience adversity, and, and uh, you know, that holds true for anything, uh, but, but it's a, uh, it, golf is a great learning ground, even at the amateur level, it doesn't make any difference what level you're at, but, you know, the final frontier is this, you know, everybody can do this and hit it, but boy, if you, if you can't do this, you, you've got no chance. You'll get to a certain level, maybe somewhat successful, media, you know, kind of maybe mediocre to good or whatever, but you know, the, to, to really get to a, 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 a pretty good level, you, you have to, uh, you, it's really a, an adventure to learn who you are and le learn who you are when things are going perfect, well, or how to, how to handle diversity. And so it's a great life uh, teacher, frankly, um, that's more than you wanted, but that's that's kind of the, that, that, that's that's kind of kind of the deal. I uh, it's always a great study to see the ones that uh, in in my day when I played and others you you could see players you knew them uh, you knew who they were get right there couldn't do it you know they 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 just could not break through and. You know, it, it doesn't feel good necessarily either. I will tell you that to be in the heat of battle, man. You know, things all churning up here, and boy, the you know all the uh, extraneous thoughts that can come to your mind. But you have to be mentally mentally strong to uh, to work yourself through that. And uh, there's a lot of things that can happen from that tee shot to the second shot, from the second shot to the green, whatever. Uh, lots of <laughs> Lots of things, but you're trained to do it. You know, you kind of are in your own little, little world.
march, marching through. Okay. Anyway, you know, uh, something I'd like to share at this time is kind of a um, <clears throat> relative, uh, not really in, in, in that thought line at all, but uh, it really wasn't until I left the tour that, um, like I said, it, it, that world is, is, is somewhat unreal and, um, however, very uh, attractive from, from a worldly perspective about, um, gosh, it's, it's, I mentioned living the dream, but gosh, who wouldn't want to play tour golf, be successful, you know, the adulation, all the stuff that comes with it. But um, along with that feeling of I've got to validate, as I mentioned, but I got to validate what I did last year. You know, there was to a certain degree, and trust me, I wouldn't want to fool you. I, I loved it. I loved all that came with it. But there, deep down, um, I could sense that um, well, there's, there's probably got to be more to this. I mean, there's a, a somewhat of an emptiness. Who, who am I really that I've got to believe? Coming off of this fabulous year, that and I've got to, I've got to think that I've got to re redo this, and and you know whose standards am I living up to? You know, uh, certainly the worldly standards. You know, is all about performance and with the opinions of others. What may, you know, what are they going to say if I don't? And boy, buying into that is a is a. Uh, I'm sure some of you have experienced that, but that is a that is a dicey little. Uh, uh, kind of place to uh, find your identity and who you, who you really are because, uh, man, the, uh, this golf, the, you know, this biz, the business, it, it, the world's standards are, are fickle. Boy, if you, you, you about, are you good enough today, we, we'll forget about you if you're not performing. So a performance-based identity is a troublesome place and uh, it wasn't really after I left the tour till I, uh, I began to understand that. And frankly, beginning a faith journey, you know, understanding where I fit in God's kingdom uh, had everything to say about who I was and where I was headed now. And, uh, you know, an important phase of my life because, and in fact, have invested my, uh, the last uh, 25 years or so in, uh, in, in, in watching what God has to uh, where, where he's wanted to take me, uh, you know, a new adventure. And boy, it has been an adventure. I, uh, this, this golf uh, profession that I played offered me up the, the most beautiful platform uh, to, to be able to share my life story with others, which incorporated, uh, you know, all the ups and downs of a, of, a, of a career, a golf career. But then, you know, the important part of it is that, uh, you know, I've kind of, Kind of grabbed a hold of, uh, of uh, from a God's perspective that you know He loves me no matter what, and you know He's given me uh, an abundance of blessing, and as He has all of us, opportunity to come to Dornick and speak to a, a, a crowd of people like this, and to be have great friends like Tim Philpot, who you know done so many things for kingdom uh, purposes, and that's where I like to find myself these days. That's what I'm doing. Uh, doing now, uh, and and golf has been a beautiful entree of that, and that can happen. You don't have to be an open champion. You can be uh, just a member of your foursome on Sunday or Saturday or Friday or whatever to uh, care about somebody, to love somebody, to serve somebody, and that's where I like to find myself now. And uh, uh, again, just recognizing just a, uh, uh, the opportunities that. Just to write before you, I have one story. I'll leave you with this. Um, a good friend of mine uh, who has discipled me for many years. Uh, he, in fact, he was responsible for me coming to faith. His name is Jim Hiskey. He started the tour Bible study, and uh, that's where I came to faith, actually. But uh, I've traveled all. It's interesting. Uh, well, I'm, I'm jumping around now, but I began life with my father in the Air Force all over the world. Germany, Africa, everywhere in the United States. The middle part of my life, the formative years of my life, playing the tour all over the world, playing golf. And now, this last part of my life, I've spent following mentors, <clears throat> mentors and traveling around the world, making friends, developing relationships, and you know, being able to share uh, what God's done in, in my life. But I remember uh, a good friend of his, it was a congressman from Indiana, his name is Tony Hall. Is it from Indiana, Tim? You, you know Tony. 
Well, anyway, Tony's a, uh, you know, he's a God man and done so much, but he was a Democratic uh, senator for many, many years. And uh, he was very involved on the front end of the beginnings of the pr uh, uh, prayer breakfast in Washington, D.C. Some of you, if any of you ever been to the prayer breakfast in Washington, D.C.? Well, what, what it is, it's a gathering of people from all over the world, but it's where the president uh, delivers a message, you know, a faith message of some sort. But there are many, many people from all over the world, and there's usually some incredible uh, people that come and speak. Well, this one year that Tony was involved in the uh, formation of the event, uh, they invited Mother Teresa. She showed. She came. Anyway, Tony was able to, uh, he tells this story so well, and, but it's, it's stuck with me for a long time. He was able to spend some intimate time. Uh, obviously, he was in her presence for the whole time she was there. He was, he was basically her, uh, her host, was with her a lot. And at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the prayer breakfast, she's uh, gonna leave, and she invites Tony to come over uh, to Calcutta with her and to, for a visit. What a, and it, I'm sure there was a lot of formality to the visit, but anyway, Tony uh, graciously accepted. He shows up in Calcutta. He's walking the streets of Calcutta with Mother Teresa. And they're walking along, and uh, you know, I know, uh, I think Tim, You've been to Calcutta, huh? And, and lots of other places. But it's probably exactly what you imagine. But they're walking along, and there's a man in the gutter, and it looks as though he's going to draw his last breath. Tony recognizes the guy, and here goes Mother Teresa over there and uh, cuddles his head. And I, I can't remember, you know, he might have died at her arms right there, but she went. Uh, out from the little little crowd walking and and uh, and and cuddled this guy and, and held him, and later on Tony uh, Tony was able to spend some one on one time with with her, and uh, he said, "What?" I mean, he was just completely overwhelmed by the by what had taken place. And he said, "What can I do? What 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 can we do?" And she just looked at him right in the eye, and obviously it'd be something you'd never forget, and he said, just take care of what's right in front of you. And that's what, I think that's what an easy thing to, for us to grab. That's what I try to, I get, boy, I get out here and the live tour and the this and the that. I can't do nothing, but I can do what's right in front of me. So I, that's a, a message I'd like to uh, leave if I could, yeah. No, oh, absolutely, Bill. Thank you very much. To, to find out you as a golfer, then you as a person. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Let's just hand over to Tommy now for the to wrap it up for us. Okay, just to thank Bill again for sharing his life's journey with us. And I'd like to uh, just to say to you all, you don't need to rush off when we're finished here. You can hang about. There's more tea. There's certainly more cakes to step out. Yes, please take some. And uh, I'd like to ask Tim to come up now and just uh, say a few words and close the meeting for us. Yeah, I'll just take two minutes. Um, Bill's my good friend. And um, we want to give you a gift uh, this evening. I'm a little bit of an author these days. I've written a novel, that, a golf novel, called Player's Progress, based on Pilgrim's Progress. But the reason you might be interested is it all happens here in Dornick. Starts on the first tee at Dornick. And it's in the year 2056. It's a novel. And by then, Royal Dornick is, is, has been ranked as the number one greatest golf course in the world. Yeah. And uh, part of that is because they, they toned back the equipment and the golf ball so that uh, uh, par 70 and 6,800 yards is, is, is good again. So. I've got a dozen books back there, and the first 12 members of Dornick who would want one, please grab one. Uh, and they're, they're free of charge. I, I know usually you only read what you pay for, but we've got 12 free books back there. <laughs> I've written two other little booklets that you would enjoy, one called Life in the Garden, Why Golf Might Be More Important Than You Think It Is. It's all about creation and the creation of places like Royal Dornick. And then another booklet called The Eternal Mulligan. 
<laughs> everybody needs a mulligan in your life, which leads into this 30-second story. I never heard his, Bill, his Mother Teresa story in my life. But, Bill, I got to meet her twice. And the second time I met her in her home in Calcutta, um, I was congratulating her for how great she is. Mother Teresa, thank you for all the good that you do. And she explained the gospel in 10 seconds. She leaned over and she touched me on my elbow, which was her way of telling me to shut up. <laughs> and she said this, and this was Mother Teresa, I'm not good. And then she turned her eyes toward heaven and she said it so softly that I had to be sitting two feet away from her to even understand her. She says, I'm not good. And then Mother Teresa said, Jesus. There's the gospel message. <laughs> I'm not good, but Jesus. So Bill, thank you. That's what's kind of saved us, isn't it? And so let me have a closing prayer and we'll go home. Lord, we thank you for this great uh, man, Bill Rogers, who's lived the life really that all of us wanted to live. <laughs> he made it to where we wanted to be, but we weren't good enough. But uh, we thank you that he came to faith and found his family, found his friends, and found his way in this world and in this life. So we give you thanks for the life of Bill and Beth Rogers. We give you thanks for the great game of golf, for our friends at Royal Dornick Golf Club, which is in fact the greatest club in the world. We thank you for that. And our friends at Dornick Christian Fellowship who blessed us tonight with the food and the space and the fellowship, we give you great thanks for these wonderful Christian people in Dornick. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Well, well, well.